who has brought all of us together. Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to you all to the IIC program, South China Sea, the geopolitics thereof. I want to take you to the year 2016. 12th of July, the Tribunal of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague gave a verdict on a case filed by the Philippines against the People's Republic of China. The tribunal rejected China's claim to the so-called Nine Dash Line. The distinguished panelists will tell you more on this uh, so-called line. The tribunal added that to the extent China had any such claims, the said claims were extinguished, I repeat, extinguished by the UN UNCLOS, that is United Nations Convention uh, on the Law of the Sea, that came into effect in 1994. India had significantly contributed to the drafting of the convention. And I wish to pay tribute to the late S.P. Jagota of the External Affairs Ministry, who led the Indian delegation throughout. Now, China is a party to the law. It has not implemented the verdict. Therefore, China has violated international law. We have to see China's behavior in the South China Sea in perspective. As part of its general behavior, including at our border. It has further violated international law by changing the facts on the ground. How has the rest of the world responded to China's aggression. What has Quad, that is India, Japan, Australia, and the United States done, and what can it do? All this the distinguished panelists will deal with. Incidentally, just because it is now known as the South China Sea, it does not follow that China owns it. Vietnam calls it East Sea. Historically, the name South China Sea was coined by Portuguese navigators who went to China from India in the 16th century. Does India claim any ownership of any island in the Indian Ocean based on the noun, the Indian Ocean? How has the rest of the world responded to China's violation of international law? Let us jump into the geopolitical waters of South China Sea. The waters are treacherous, but we have two panelists with expertise in navigation in such waters. The panelists are Admiral H.C.S. Bisht and Commodore R. Sheshadri Waz. Neither needs any introduction. The panelists will speak for about 15 minutes or a few minutes more or less, and so that we shall have enough time for Q&A. Please feel free to type your uh, observations and questions because the IIC attaches high importance to what you have to say. The first to speak is uh, Vice Admiral HCS Bisht, PVSM, AVSM, former Flag Officer, Commander-in-Chief, Eastern Naval Command, and former Director General, Indian Coast Guard. Presently, he is an Administrative Member, Armed Forces Tribunal. He is speaking to us from Chandigarh. Admiral, please jump into the waters. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Fabian, sir. <clears throat> it is indeed a great, great pleasure and an honor 
to share my thoughts on this very contemporary subject so without uh, further ado i will i will start uh i'll start my subject today the uh, the the first slide in the presentation today uh, i will give you a uh, short historical background of all the important events or important activities that have taken place as far as this dispute is concerned in uh, 1933 to 39 france who were the colonial masters of indo china that time had controlled some of the features in the region 1947 the control of the south china started with something called 11 dash line by then the the kuomintang government of the republic of china which present presently is taiwan 1949 uh, is the line that i have highlighted and this is the this was the time when the line was revised to a nine dash line which was a line drawn free hand by the chinese cartographers incidentally this uh, activity had also been undertaken way back in 1929 but in 1949 it was done in a formal manner 1974 is another important date where china attacked south vietnam to seize the yagong islands in the paracel group 1978 president ferdinand marcos of the philippines declared the northwestern part of spratlys as philippine territory and 1988 and 1994 china occupied the johnson reef and mischief reef in a conflict with vietnam and philippines respectively 2002 was the declaration of the code of conduct in south china sea as far as asian nations was concerned however nothing much has happened on that 2012 uh, was a defining moment where the scarborough shoal was taken or seized by china and uh, that was a trigger for philippines to take the matter to the permanent court of arbitration at the hague uh, which is which uh, ambassador fabian had mentioned in his ambassador in his inaugural uh, talk uh, 2013 to 2015 china undertook illegal reclamation of the islands and uh, 2016 as ambassador fabian mentioned the pca verdict was given against 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 china by the permanent court of arbitration now what is the cause of the dispute china claims nearly 90% of the south china sea through the nine dash line the area far exceeds what is claimable under united nations convention on law of the seas and includes waters that are quite close to the coast of all the claimant countries um, the other cause is a huge presence of oil and gas the united states has undertaken two independent estimates and as per them uh, south china sea holds about 350 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 23 billion barrels of oil in proven and probable reserves uh, china's estimates are literally double of that at 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 125 billion barrels of oil and more than 5.3 trillion dollars worth of trade passes through the south china sea annually South China Sea accounts for nearly 10% of fish which is caught globally and with blue economy gaining traction in the world countries now see an uh, tremendous opportunities for minerals in South China Sea which also includes gold and the other cause is China's high headedness and coercion of smaller maritime neighbors in the South China Sea region coming to composition of the South China Sea Uh, it contains over 250 small islands atolls reefs etc most submerged at high tide while some are submerged permanently features can be grouped as uh, as pratlis paracels scarborough shoal pratas islands and macclesfield bank china vietnam taiwan philippines malaysia and brunei lay claim to the islands and china has also had skirmish with indonesia though indonesia is not a direct claiming to the claimant to the south china sea it has problems with china in the natuna islands coming individually to the various um, islands which have been militarized by china uh, first the spratlys group fiery cross reef uh, which is one of the big three that is fiery cross reef subi reef and mischief reef this is the southernmost island and uh, china has done it very strategically they have developed three important islands at the geographical extremities uh, extremities of north south and east so that they literally control the whole of south china sea and uh, the total area reclaimed is 677 acres 
infrastructure available in these in this fiery cross reef is a 300 meters runway ray domes and uh, hf arrays for um, anti access area defense philosophy which of china hangars and helipads and 6.25 uh, square kilometers uh, with enough berthing uh, Subi Reef is the largest outpost in the Spratlys, area 5.8 kilometers by 3.2 kilometers. Northernmost island in Spratlys, large naval harbor with 11 berths. Entrance to lagoon is 230 meters, which is a huge entrance. Uh, again, 3,300 meters long runway, hangars, helipads, large radomes, SATCOM and DF antennae, emplacements for missiles, hardened fuel storage, facilities to track uh, satellites, and also and take military activity. Uh, Mischief Reef is the easternmost island in Spratly's extensive land reclamation of 5.58 square kilometers, large harbor, 3,100 uh, meters runway, seven radomes, air defense guns and missiles, and cement plant. <clears throat> Coming now to the Paracel group. So uh, Paracels is in the Paracel, as you can see, is the uh, northern uh, group of islands. Spratly's was the southern group of islands. Uh, Paracels comprises 130 small islands, reefs, keys, etc. It is claimed by China, Vietnam, and Taiwan, but controlled by China. Woody Islands is the main island. It is actually the main island in the entire uh, Paracels and Spratlys groups. Most structures have harbors capable of birthing ships. Uh, Woody Island is the northern edge of Paracels, 2,700 meters long runway. There's a large harbor, a detachment of marine surveillance unit. Hangars for J-10 and J-11 fighter aircraft. There's a uh, large number of surve surveillance radars. HQ-9 SAM battery, battery uh, which has a range of almost 200 kilometers, surface-to-air missiles. And then YJ-62 anti-ship cruise missile, a ASCM, a uh, range of about 1,500 kilometers of firing was carried out in 2016. And you can see in the slide, the lowermost slide, you can see a J-11 fighter aircraft, which is on the uh, runway for takeoff. Scarborough Shoal is a huge shoal, area 150 square kilometers, perimeter 46 kilometers with a high tide elevation of nearly six feet. It is 120 nautical miles west of Philippines and uh, 550 nautical miles southeast of Hainan Island of China. China started eyeing this shoal after US withdrawal from Subic Bay Naval Base and Clark's Air Base in the Philippines in 1992. And in 2012, China occupied this shoal after forcing the Philippine Coast Guard and fishermen from the area in a tense conflict that lasted for weeks. And this, ladies and gentlemen, was a trigger for taking the appeal to the International uh, Court, the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. Pratas Island, also called Dongsha by China, comprises three islands in the northeastern South China Sea, 211 nautical miles southeast of Hong Kong, governed by Taiwan, also claimed by China. Macclesfield Bank, you can see Macclesfield Bank, an elongated sunken atoll of underwater reefs and shoals in the South China Sea, lies east of Paracels, uh, southwest of Pratas, and north of Spartlys. Length is 130 kilometers with approximately 70, width of approximately 70 kilometers. It is one of the largest atolls in the world, completely submerged. Now, coming now to Vietnam's presence in South China Sea, Vietnam has undertaken only 57 acres of reclamation when compared to 3,200 acres by China, despite the fact that Vietnam has proximity to both these uh, group of islands. It has 27 features in the Spratlys group, out of which only two islands are developed, and that too in a benign manner. The biggest one is Spratly Island. Uh, it is different from the Spratlys group. It is Spratly Island, the largest of Vietnam's outposts, houses a harbor and 1,300 meters runway. It was only up to 750 meters till recently. It has two hangars, has SIGINT and communication facilities. And the uh, slide at the lower end shows uh, another reef, which is called Pearson Reef. It only has a helipad and a ray dome. Now coming to Philippines' uh, presence in these islands, Thitu Island is one which Philippines occupies, has presence in nine features. The main island is Thitu, being administered by Philippines since 1974, also called Pegasa in the local Philippines language called Tagalog. China has also been claiming it and has been sending PLA Navy and Chinese Coast Guard CCG ships regularly. 
Incidentally, Chinese vessels were sighted more than 600 times near Thetu in 2019. Uh, Taiwan's presence, Itu Aba is the main feature which is occupied by Taiwan as a Spratlys, only 110 acres, largest natural feature in the archipelago, in the entire archipelago, 1300 meters runway and a small natural harbor. Zongao Reef, uh, which, is, uh, which also is in Taiwan's uh, control, is nine uh, nautical miles away, which is shown uh, down below in the lower uh, slide. Now, coming to militarization of the South China Sea by China, the facilities created by China are approximately uh, three kilometer long runways on four islands. We have already seen that for both military and civil usage. Elaborate port infrastructure, including fuel and water storage for ships hangars for storage of aircraft, large number of defenses, including missiles and guns, various types of radars, communications, EW electronic warfare, and other associated facilities. Facilities for enhancement of PLAs, surveillance and intelligence capabilities, and early warning via HF arrays, which I mentioned earlier, for anti-access in area denial, A to AD philosophy to hold the US Navy at bay and connectivity with the new STC or the Southern Theater Command and the PLA Rocket Force Command for control of DF-21 and DF-26 strategic missiles. Now, UN Convention of the uh, Law of the Seas, UNCLOS, what is the relevance of what I'm showing you to the present crisis? Uh, UNCLOS says low tide elevations such as shoals, sandbanks, etc., that may become visible during low tides and artificial islands may not generate territorial waters except if located within territorial waters of a coastal state. Archipelagic states such as Indonesia and Philippines are permitted to establish the so-called straight baselines to join up their island territories and to extend such territorial and contiguous seas to cover wider areas than otherwise be lawful. And coastal states like China, this is important, coastal states like China are not allowed this provision. This provision only extends to archipelagic states like Indonesia and Philippines. Naval vessels passing through any foreign territorial waters and contiguous seas are not required to give advance notice or seek permission from a sovereign state as long as they take they undertake innocent passage. Now, what did the PCA ruling say? In July, uh, July 2016, the PCA ruled that China's claims to historic rights over the South China Sea encompassed by the nine dash line would not exceed its maritime uh, rights under the Law of the Sea Conventions. The tribunal invalidated Beijing's claims to ill-defined historic rights throughout the Nine Dash Line. Scarborough Shoal, they said, was entitled only to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. A large number of features are not legally islands because they cannot sustain a stable human community or independent economic life therefore entitled only to uh, territorial seas and no EZs or continental shelves. In the Spratlys occupied by China, the court ruled that most of them are below water at high tide and therefore generate no maritime entitlements of their own. Final outcome of the PCA verdict against China as, was as follows. Beijing's activities in the Philippines EEZ, such as artificial island construction, interference with Philippines fishing and exploration activities, constituted a violation of sovereign rights of the Philippines. So why is China so interested? First, I have already mentioned to you proven reserves of oil and gas. Next is control of the sea lines of communication flocks through the South China Sea and to ensure energy security through both through the Pacific Ocean and also the Indian Ocean since South China Sea literally connects the, the two oceans. Considers South China Sea and East China Sea, SCS and ECS, as its own strategic backyard, plans to extend its reach to exercise A to AD strategy, which I have mentioned earlier. South China Sea provides good opening into the Indian Ocean region, where all big players uh, want to gain easy access. Domestic and political factors, which are, it is a South China Sea is a matter of prestige for the Chinese Communist Party, for the CCP. President Xi Jinping has used the construction of artificial islands in the South China Sea to fan nationalist sentiment and strengthen his authority over the PLA. And control of South China Sea is a precursor to, to his, uh, Xi Jinping's, ambitious Belt and Road, in, Road Initiative project. Now, China's strategy in South China Sea is plans to group together tiny, wide, widely dispersed islets 
with state baselines inside which it claims sovereignty over every feature and even the waters thus nationalizing waters which are or which are were hitherto international from the state baselines the, the prc claims territorial seas surrounding the entire group of islets rather than individual features and despite international law on innocent passage foreign naval ships are asked to obtain permission before sailing through south china sea and china sea south china sea as an important constitu constituent of the southern theater command stc and it seeks to establish sovereignty throughout this scs littoral including undersea resources to displace the us from the region and plans to form a strategic triangle with a major base on woody island which is on paracels and secondary bases on spratly spratly islands and a similar base on scarborough shoal thus forming a the triangle of strategic control over south china sea and from the new military bases thus constructed that means the headquarters literally on woody island and others on fairy cross reef mischief reef subi reef etc china plans to create strategic bubbles from which to expand military operations outwards now what is the fine print of china's strategy the china perceives threat from east and southeast coast which is geographically hemmed in by us and its allies that is korea japan taiwan philippines etc south china sea provides open seas for military operations especially naval operations and extension of strategic depth south and eastwards to protect the prosperous east and southeast coast uh, coast which is a han chinese majority uh, in the coastal uh, region of china security of the yulin naval base in hainan which is home to the pla uh, chinese nuclear deterrent or pla navy nuclear submarine fleet Taiwan being a core interest for China Beijing cannot exert full control over it if it does not have significant power in South China Sea and with control over South China Sea Beijing sees itself as a step closer to reunification with Taiwan China is very suspicious of US strategy to of pivot to Asia of 2011 and reconfiguration of the Pacific Command to Indo Pacific Command now this uh, new term called uh, forsha claim China has coined a new phrase called forsha claim forsha means sand and the uh, chinese felt that uh, the nine dash line was becoming too much of an embarrassment for them so they have coined this uh, new phrase called forsha claim and the new narrative involves a shift from china's so called nine dash line but covering literally the same area forsha's heralds a more new more modest modest chinese form of its claim in the south china sea however experts believe that this is just another gimmick by china to justify its claim this is a pictorial depiction uh, of the forsha claim where literally you can see the uh, the line in uh, pink which is almost same as the nine dash line now what is the role of the united states and the onops freedom of navigation operations us has vital strategic interests in the region has got strategic and uh, strategic partnerships with the Japan South Korea Philippines Taiwan Singapore etc large number of US military bases in the region like 7th fleet headquarters based in uh, Yokosuka Japan naval and marine uh, core and air bases particularly in Japan and Korea almost 40 or 40 bases they have in the entire region Korean peninsula issue China is vociferous in denouncing US presence in the region stating that uh, Chinese question US moral authority to intervene in South China Sea being an outside power and more importantly being a non signatory to the unclos incidentally us is a non signatory to unclos most countries see us providing security umbrella if china ever tries to coerce any one of them by military action us navy ships have increased their presence in the region recently two carrier strike groups nimitz and ronald reagan group deployed along with a fleet of about 13 14 ships and about 200 plus aircraft and us considers fun ops necessary to maintain rule based order role of asean asean solidarity of the 90s has been fractured due to china's big brother attitude and the checkbook diplomacy we all know what is his checkbook diplomacy china has isolated philippines and bought over silence of a number of asean members started imposing an unspoken red line about the mention of arbitral award happened immediately after the award in 2016 china's coercive tactics were also against countries who spoke in favor of the arbitral award like vietnam singapore indonesia etc Philippines appeal received muted support from most ASEAN members under Chinese coercion and Chinese propagated this silence as a diplomatic victory for Beijing 
and asean china as i mentioned earlier the code of conduct is only on paper role of international com community 33 countries support rules rule based uh, order and acknowledge the ruling while six were opposed to it us uk uh, countries in eu australia japan india south korea and new zealand have issued strong statements japan considers south china to be see to be its economic vein and can't see it in chinese control has supplied 12 coast guard boats to philippines has promised to lease a surveillance aircraft has also assured maritime assistance to vietnam south korea is transferring an opv offshore patrol vessel to philippines countries in the region expect us to play a bigger role in the south china sea to balance china's assertiveness and i saw in the news recently that us has promised transfer of 90 very sophisticated medium sized boats to philippines what are the implications for india india's concerns are any instability in south china sea will affect trade with asean india's largest trade partners with a total trade valued at 71 billion dollars in 2017 nearly 55% of india's trade passes through south china sea india has excellent relationship with vietnam ongc videsh has investments in vietnam bilateral relations with philippines are improving president and prime minister visited philippines in 2019 and 2017 respectively numerous visits by ian ships china is jittery with our We have lost the connectivity. Let us hope and pray for connectivity to be re-established. Uh, Wasim, can anything be done to re-establish connectivity, please? I'll have to check with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Admiral Best. So just just you continue, sir. This time I'm trying to connect with him. Yes. Uh, well, uh, we shall wait for. Uh, uh the admiral but who has given us uh, such an exhaustive account uh, history legality and uh, what is happening on the ground let's give him a little more time Well, maybe we should proceed now. What we can do is that uh, let us uh, request uh, uh, the next speaker, that is Commodore uh, Arshe Shadri Vazan. Uh, and then later on, you know, if uh, the Admiral has anything more to say, he will rejoin us. Now, uh, Commodore Arshe Shadri Vazan is uh, Director, China Center of, uh, sorry, Chennai Center of China Studies. And he's also regional director, National Maritime Foundation. Uh, he has decades of experience in teaching in universities, think tanks in India and abroad, including University of Bath, Nanjing University, Chatham House, to mention only a few. He is uh, joining us from Bangalore, as I said uh, earlier. Commodore. Uh, Please uh, jump into the waters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I hope you can hear me. Uh, good evening, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Uh, great pleasure being here, and thanks for this opportunity. I'm also happy to see Admiral Bish back. You know, and both of us did serve in the Coast Guard. He, of course, was the Director General Coast Guard, and I was the Regional Commander. You know, many years uh, before that. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to connect with all of you. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to discuss on this particular issue of the relevance of South China Sea to India and what developments are taking place. My biggest disadvantage today is that I am speaking after uh, you know that wonderful uh, presentation by Admiral Bisht. So it's it's quite possible that uh, there's not much left for me as far as uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the, the content is concerned, but I'll try and uh, uh, see what I can uh, share and also perhaps uh, have a little more uh, time given to people for, uh, uh, you know, the question answer sessions. I'll just start sharing my screen. One second, give me a minute. Can you please confirm it's sharing? Are the slides visible? Uh, yes, I can see All it. Right. Yeah, thank you, sir. So basically, I am what I'm trying to look at is after that presentation, a lot of backdrop has already been provided by Admiral Bisht. So it, to a certain extent, it makes my job simpler. In fact, after I looking looked at some of his uh, slides yesterday, I did modify my slides so that I do not repeat what he's already said. So to that extent, I'll try and avoid repetition to the extent possible. So this was the scope of talk that was assigned to us by Ambassador Fabian when he got in touch with us. And these are some of the questions that we'll try and answer today. So what has China done in violation of an clause in South China Sea? Since when? And when did others start objecting? And apart from objecting, has any literal country resisted? Some of these have already been answered. And you saw that though Philippines is a small country, you know, it mustered enough courage to approach the permanent code of arbitration and won, won, won the uh, award in its favor in 2016 as was brought out. So, but the point is that uh, nothing much has been done by anybody else. You know, your mere uh, freedom of navigation operations is not going to allow the smaller states to reclaim this island. The next one was of the geopolitical importance of South China Sea, which has been well covered by uh, Admiral Bisht in terms of the geostrategic importance, or in terms of importance of the fisheries wealth, the minerals, oil and gas that's contained in the South China Sea, and also more importantly, the importance to China to further its uh, military and strategic ambitions. The ASEAN track record, we'll look at it a little more uh, because I've taken it upon to see that uh, we cover ASEAN's response. Uh, but as has already been brought out, there's not much that ASEAN as a collective community has done to take on the might of China. India's take capability to address the challenges well, you know, it's, it's very clear, you know, in the recent past, particularly after the after the transgression in Himalayas, we realized that while we can hold off the challenge in the mountains, a lot of leverages can be brought to bear, perhaps only in the maritime domain. So how much can we do is again uh, a factor of how much can you do on your own and how much you need to be able to do by alliances. This is where the court comes in. So I will discuss this a little more later. On the US policy, the pivot to Asia under Obama, under Trump, and of course, now under Biden, what, what more can be expected? And do we see radical changes that are going to take place in South China Sea in the coming years? The Quad, the history, the Malabar exercises, and is the Quad vulnerable to pressure from uh, uh, China on Australia, Japan in trade and economic matters? And will China get away with what has done? And can it be stopped or how can it be stopped? So now let's to understand this, I would like to go beyond just the South China Sea and look at China's expansive thrust. It's important to understand how all this is so well orchestrated. Uh, so look at this. It's basically using its economy, you know, the economic power to possess deep pockets to support the Belt Road Initiative, call it One Belt, One Road, or the Maritime Silk Road, and the instruments of investments for FDI routes, capturing of territory as in South China Sea, militarization of these islands which have been reclaimed by it, economic subjugation aka the uh, the east india company so these these are the economy has been a major factor which has given it the kind of capability uh, to uh, go ahead and uh, launch its initiatives from asia to africa to europe and the other most important thing is that uh, bite for time and of course build your strength and surprise the world it's done it very well except that post covid perhaps it did not bite for time enough so the whole world is against China now. This perhaps one time, in my assessment, it's miscalculated the timing of its aggressive posturing, whether it's in South China Sea or Trans Himalaya. An empowered leader, you know, you have a leader for life, Xi. So therefore, he has already said that what is China's dream is his dream too. So he is going to go out of his way to succeed 
because he cannot be seen to uh, fail in some of these initiatives. The extended standoff, even in Himalayas today, you know, is entirely due to the fact that he cannot be seen as losing his face uh, to a small nation in comparison to, to what China has engaged in, in, uh, in adventurism. And of course, the growth with Chinese characteristics, they are trying to sell this idea that China's uh, Communist Party and the system has worked well for them and it used to be possible for others to emulate this. So it is the Chinese success story that she has persistently asked others, that is his, uh, you know, office bearers, his consul generals, his diplomatic missions to sell this Chinese story, the success story. And then, of course, the battle space domination, as was brought out by Admiral Bisht also, every island that is within the Sai China Sea has been militarized. There are military garrisons, there are SAM systems, there are runways. So these are now virtually the permanently anchored carriers. Because when you look at the geography, you'll find that uh, the Chinese aircraft are limited in uh, going beyond the first and second line of defense unless they have some place to refuel in the, and turn around their operational assets. This is where this issue of battle space domination through militarization of the acquired assets comes handy. Then the strategic military cloud to protect core interests. So here, you know, they're again following the same old dictum, which is power from the barrel of the gun. Only thing is now it's become uh, a DF-21 or a DF-26 or, or a satellite controlled missile, which can take on the carrier battle group, which is, which is their primary threat as far as China is concerned. And then of course, there are specific targets, unlike in other uh, countries, uh, they work to a target and the major target of concern is just five years from now, when they are aiming to have a moderately prosperous community and be the number one by 2049, which is 100 years of the Communist uh, Party. So this uh, has already been shown just to re-emphasize, please look at the color code here. And what you see are the Parasal Islands right in the center. And of course, Taiwan, which is shown there. The Scarbello shown, uh, the developments of which in which is covered by Admiral, so I'm not going to cover those. And then of course, you see the proximity of Spratly Island, which is again right there, shown in the big circle over here. And you know, this is the one which is there. So this is roughly tells you why China is so interested in shoring up its capability within the South China Sea, even though most of these are disputed. Now, this is the flashpoint that we are looking at. You know, what was explained as Forsha or the Dine Dash line is nothing but this line that you see over here, all the way extending from here. And that tells you that it considers the entire South China Sea virtually as a lake in which it has full control. Even the idea of Nine Dash line, you know, as per the UNCLOS, is to ensure that whatever is claimed within the Nine Dash line, if it is accepted, then they can use the provisions of UNCLOS for extending the exclusive economic zone and also for ensuring that there is adequate control in terms of protecting their assets over here. So this is where it becomes important for us to know why China considers the entire South China Sea as something that it must control as if it is its backyard. So where does India come into the South China Sea? The trade interests, the actist policy of India has already enabled us to have deep networks with countries there, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Japan, whether it's South Korea, we have traditional linkages as well as diplomatic military exchanges with all this. And also China has a big problem in terms of geography. You know, unlike India, you know, which has access to both sides of the sea, as you see here, whether it is the Arabian Sea here or whether it is the Bay of Bengal, you know, it has easy access in the Indian Ocean region. It is not for any other reason that it is also called the Indian Ocean. So China obviously is envious of the geographical advantage it has. And, you know, the usual term that we use is the hesitations of China to come into Indian, nation, Indian Ocean because of the tyranny of distance. You know, it has to cover tens of thousands of kilometers to reach its areas of interest, whether it's the anti-piracy missions here or whether it is the, uh, the, the military base that it has in uh, Djibouti or the Middle East for oil energy security. This is where it has its, uh, you know, Ashley's heel. So it is very concerned about it and it would like to counter this by setting up bases here, which is not, of course, the topic of discussion today. But all this has relevance to not just what it is doing in South China Sea, but also what it aims to do in the Indian Ocean region by developing constituencies, by investing in smaller countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Maldives and countries along the African coast. 
So this is something that that will drive the geography of the future and the geo strategy of in the coming decades. So what is the evolving nature of Indo-Pacific? Because to counter whatever China does in the South China Sea, there are issues that we need to deal in the Indo-Pacific. Now it's, this term has come to be accepted, though you know yesterday you would have read the report that the Russian foreign minister uh, was saying that India is perhaps uh, being used by the big power uh, in the so-called alliances of the Quad or the Indo-Pacific or the freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. So this has become a top regional priority for Trump, and it's unlikely to change because this is part of the NSS 2017. And I've only pulled out some of this due to time constraints, which are of importance to us in the Indo-Pacific area. So this is what was brought out by the uh, 2017 document. It said it's a geopolitical competition between free and repressive visions of world order that is taking place. China is also using economic inducements and penalties, operations, and implied military threats, obviously through the South China Sea, as well as militarization of uh, uh, Djibouti, and also continuous deployment of its military assets in the Indian Ocean, whether it is SSBNs or SSNs, or even uh, his uh, ships, which are regularly on petrol. And of course, promoting quadrilateral cooperation with Japan, Australia, and India. In fact, America has placed, uh, USA has placed a lot of importance in having this alliance, you know, despite some reservations initially, hesitations by Australia, even India was a hesitant partner. But China, in my opinion, has pushed both India and Australia, you know, strongly into this alliance. It has a lot of potential, while there are also questions about how will it do all, but it should not be abandoned just because you do not know what to do with it. So what is the strategic underpinning of economy and trade? The Indo-Pacific strategy of USA, as per the NSS 2017, is about fair and reciprocal trade and infrastructure investment from the World Bank and ASEAN Development Bank. You know, this is important because there's a lot of money that's been earmarked for infrastructure development by China, and that's being invested along the Belt and Road Econ, uh, initiatives. And also the importance of rule of law, individual rights, and freedom of navigation, all of this which has been violated by China, as has been seen uh, in the incidents that I will quote a little later. And of course, Secretary of State Rex Hellerson, who visited India, placed heavy emphasis on working closely with India and defense and security across the Indo-Pacific. Now, this is evident from the stream of various things which you have signed, whether it is LIMOVA or uh, MSSTA or BECA. There's a slew of uh, agreements that we have signed, and all this perhaps would provide some kind of a collective ability for the nations involved to contain China to a certain extent, particularly in terms of its aggressive behavior, uh, both in the maritime domain and across, uh, ocean, uh, across the land borders. And ASEAN countries are limited. You know, you might say whatever you want to uh, about ASEAN's ability to take on China, because of the economic dependence, they are not in a position. To. And China believes in dealing with them separately on bilateral uh, mode, and does not believe in dealing with ASEAN as a community because it knows that it can divide and rule. You now, which explains the behavior of China when it deals with the code of conduct or with some of the initiatives that have been proposed by other members of the ASEAN. And the code of conduct has been in the making for decades. And it is, uh, you know, everybody says each year that this will happen this year. But obviously, there are many doubts because uh, it, China plays this just as it plays with India, saying that, you know, we have you know, undemarcated borders. So it gives it a lot of flexibility to use this as a leverage, whether it is in the case of ASEAN or with, with India. And so here are some of the groupings that are there. All of these are important in terms of what is happening in South China Sea. Enough has been said about Quad and its potential. There are definitely questions. It's not a fully evolved platform as such, because though it started in 2007, you know, and it was abandoned, thanks to the resistance by China, uh, which accused the four democratic nations of ganging together. But today, there is a situation that demands that these people work together. It need not be limited only to military responses. It can also take on many other roles in terms of uh, climate control, in terms of providing humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, such and rescue measures, increasing the potential of other countries in Asia. So the, the, it is, it is, the possibilities are endless but it is for these four nations to now put their heads together. Within India, now the MEA has a separate Indo-Pacific division, which also has the Quad. So you, you need to be serious about how you want this to shape 
for meeting our future requirements. ASEAN, we have said enough. Uh, it's unlikely that ASEAN, as, as a collective group, will be able to take on China. Because with the RCEP, you'll find that there will be greater interaction. And with the abstention of uh, India, uh, you find that the trade deficit with individual ASEAN countries, as far as China is concerned, will be to its favor. Uh, I will not say much about IORA and IANS, uh, maybe except in the question answer session to take it up and see what it role it has, if at all, uh, in uh, taking on China. So what is the power play contours in the ASEAN? These are some of the factors which must take note of. US has withdrawn from the TPP, and this led to a power vacuum, allowing China to come in in a big way. India has deferred joining RCEP for very obvious and uh, uh, you know uh, good reasons, but there are question marks on uh, how long will you be away from RCEP and whether it will actually help your uh, self-reliance or will it give more advantage to China? These are questions that need to be taken up later. And of course, ASEAN members firmly are in the grip of China because of, like I said, the investments. People like Cam countries like Cambodia, Philippines and all that have learned it the hard way that uh, you know they cannot uh, even resist any of the proposals made by China. As far as Philippines is concerned, it's despite winning the award, uh, you know, Duterte was engaged by China. They promised him a lot. And even now he's realized that he uh, fell into the trap. And uh, now he's rightly increasingly looking at USA and others to bail him out of a situation that he got into, expecting miracles to happen as far as uh, the mutual relations are concerned. And Malaysia, you know, when Mahathir came back, though a 93-year-old man, when he came back, he cancelled the BR projects because he realized the folly of getting money and without creating job employment for locals and also getting into a debt trap, you know, call it check up, let me see a debt trap. The point is that uh, Malaysia was able to negotiate a lot of these projects. And, you know, you realized recently also, even with the change of the uh, uh, president, uh, you found that there are new equations and they have cancelled one more project. So there are these developments that are taking place. Not everything is to the advantage of China, but it's for others to see where there are wedges which can be driven for uh, uh, ensuring that we derive benefit out of this. China now also has another phenomena within the uh, South China Sea where it carries out aggressive fishing in others exclusive economic zone. And we know, <coughs> sorry, they have even sank a Vietnamese fishing vessel. And you know, this is supported by the maritime militia. This is a new phenomenon on South China Sea where the fishing fleets go out into other territory and you find that they are hovering around. Even within the India, uh, they are bordering or just outside the exclusive economic zone and then they note that there is no patrolling. They are poaching in our areas. So this is an aggressive kind of a uh, fishing expeditions that they indulge in with the support of their coast guards. So this is a serious uh, development both in the South China Sea as well as in the Indian Ocean region. <coughs> And all the militarization of the reclaimed islands, I'm not sure how anybody can take back these islands, whether it's the climate is Brunei or Philippines or Malaysia or whoever, it's highly unlikely that without a military conflict, any of these islands can be taken back. And America uh, in the past has not even protested strongly. In fact, I think the world just stood by and watched the militarization of these islands, you know, except for some protests here and there. Perhaps it has become too late for the international community to do anything about uh, reclaiming of any of these islands and restoring it to the original awareness. And particularly with the fact that China did not even want to get into the arbitration mode when Philippines uh, went to the PCA. <clears throat> so what is the prognosis? Uh, I just have two more slides and we should be adequate for uh, me to set the floor for questions. So the inevitability of Cold War, the Cold War is already on. The trade warfare and technology denials have come in post COVID. And you know, you heard about 5G, you heard about uh, smart chips, you have heard about uh, various things that are happening. All these are part of the Cold War that is, uh, uh, you know, developing in other areas as well. So this will also become inevitable as more and more people would like to ha reduce their dependency on China, whether it is ASEAN, whether it is members who are now the disputants in South China Sea, any opportunity that is presented to them would be taken. But China is not, not going to sit uh, back and uh, say, okay, everything is okay and let the world take whatever they want to. So they will resist and they will use the money. You know, there are uh, trillions of uh, US dollars in its custody and it is in a position to use this. There will definitely be new alignments, not just squad, 
but there will be other kinds of alignments and i did mention quad plus so you could perhaps have south korea new zealand australia getting in there if china compels them to get into this kind of effort so china obviously uh, is uh, pushing some of these alliances if you ask me uh, much to the detriment of its own long term interests the economic squeeze without exceptions through china appears slightly better place because of you not know, the only country that had a positive growth after covid whereas everyone else was on a negative uh, uh, bind a hardening of positions of undecided players like india who will hopefully overcome hesitations of history to chart a new course by aligning with interests because india has made it very clear including by our own uh, external affairs minister that we do not uh, abandon our autonomy the strategic autonomy is fully in place it only means that we will align with interests strategic interests so if it means that we have to buy the 400 from russia we will go ahead as 400 and if it means that we have to buy a predator drone from america we will go ahead so most of this is to do with uh, what we can gain from this alliances of of uh, national interest and long term which some our serve our long term interest so impact on global institutions whether it is who imf like who america had withdrawn with the joe biden coming back uh, there are indications that they'll perhaps join back imf the loan terms and all that were not very favorable which allowed china to come in a big way to help uh, smaller nations so there would be certain structural adjustment which must be encouraged by india and creation of alternate pools for countering bri msr and here i quote the asia africa growth corridor you know just india and japan have been talking about it to help out the developing countries in africa and asia but for this to happen and to provide a, a credible counter to bri funds you need more countries here you need the european union you need the usa Uh, you need others who can come and have a, a pool of money over here which can counter the investment and influences that china is wielding in uh, smaller countries who are looking for money every country requires uh, investments everyone requires uh, infrastructure and development every country requires job so if this can be facilitated by any fund they will not hesitate why are our neighbors going to china it's because we are not in a position to provide the kind of money that is there therefore i think collectively we need to be able to provide this kind of assistance economic assistance infrastructural assistance or military assistance to smaller neighbors who otherwise uh, perforce would be driven to china whether you like it or not and increased military posturing and spending is inevitable now you seen that uh, you know india has also uh, given a lot of freedom to ensure that uh, our military preparedness is not brought down and so this will be the pattern across nations whether it's japan or india or australia you will see increased defense spending so some nations obviously the advanced military defense uh, industry will be very happy with this development but i don't think uh, that's a good sign but that's something that we have to contend with so what is this is an interesting statement you know once you read it you'll realize how prophetic this one is i will uh, towards the end tell you who said this if one day china should change her color and turn into a super power if she too should pay the tyrant in the world and everyone subject others to her bullying aggression and exploitation there no doubt that it is happening now the people of the world should identify her as a social imperialism expose it oppose it and work together with the chinese people to overthrow it surprise here is the gentleman who said this in 1974 so whether he was playing to the gallery whether he was trying to integrate china better by saying that we are very conscious of our role in international mechanisms that's now debatable but the point is that this is the statement that it has made therefore we just need to follow the prescriptions of tang jiaping thank you jai hind thank you commodore wasan for uh, that uh, insightful multi dimensional and yet very lucid uh, presentation and uh, you are ending with uh, that uh, quotation from deng xiaoping in 1974 that was very very what shall i say remarkable we shall certainly carry that now i just want to tell uh, admiral bish that uh, when we lost connection with you i was telling the audience uh, that uh, you gave us a very history rich and uh, what shall i say geopolitical rich presentation now if you have any points to add we shall wait for you before we go to question and answer 
Um, I think I, uh, you know, the net went off uh, at the last slide, that the conclusion slide. So uh, uh, is that right, sir? Is that, uh, did you see the uh, conclusion slide? I think that was the conclusion slide where I also noticed the net going off. Thank you. We saw that yes, and... Uh, oh, nothing, nothing further, sir. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a very eventful uh, excursion into the treacherous waters of the South China Sea. I have some questions here from the audience. Let me see. Uh, I will go one by one. There is a question from Sri S.P. Gore. Um, is there any way to make China follow the ruling of international court on the Philippine petition? And uh, Sri Gaur has one more question. I thought, you know, those questions can be answered together. What impact, if any, Quad will have on Chinese expansionist moves? Now, I was just thinking, I'm changing, uh, uh, you know, what I said. That is, uh, considering that it's almost, uh, you know, five o'clock, is it? Uh, I would add one more question, and that is from Sri Anurag Tapil, Deradun. With two other members of Quad, part of RCEP, how long can India keep out of it? So let us do it this way, that we shall ask each of the panelists to answer all the questions. Who would like to go first? Yes, Commodore. All right, sir. I know I think there are important questions because we are trying to come to grips with the developing situation today. <clears throat> and these are real challenges that we have. Uh, coming to the how to make China, uh, you know, accept the PCA verdict, I see uh, no future. It's very simple. They did not even participate in the, in the negotiations. And as per the UNCLOS, when the tribunal asked them to participate, they said, we don't even acknowledge the fact that there's a dispute. So if this is the state, how do you get them to the table, you know, without a war? And also, uh, the, even America, as Admiral also brought out, it has signed the UNCLOS but it has not ratified it. You know, there's an important aspect of uh, signing and ratification. Whereas China, India and all that, you know, we also ratified it using our domestic law. So unless the domestic lawmakers uphold the ratification within USA, USA, at least on paper, appears to lose the moral ground for telling China what to do, which is what China will say. So, you know, uh, China has to be integrated into the rule-based system, which is what we are finding difficult today. And I do not see anything happening as far as uh, making China accept the verdict of PCA. It will not happen because physically it is occupied these areas. It is important to it economically, strategically, politically, and it, nobody can take it back from it today. That is the reality. And it acknowledges this reality and therefore it is happy with the status quo. So I do not see the status quo changing. On the other issue of Quad, uh, you know, remember it is not something that happened today. It started in 2007. And at that time, there was a lot more hesitation because the expectation was that China would get integrated better. And therefore, it's no point ruffling the feathers of China, which is why Australia and India were a little more sensitive to China. But the time has come not to be sensitive about China. You know, how many occasions have we seen China being sensitive to India's concerns? You know, whether it's an exercise or militarization of Pakistan, supplying nuclear missiles, submarines, ships. When has they been sensitive to our concern or in the recent standoff? So, you know, I don't think we should worry about the sensitivities of China and ensure that Quad, you know, if China was not worried about Quad, why would it talk about it so vehemently? Obviously, it has the desired effect of being able to apply some kind of a pressure. And uh, so we feel that we should be able to, uh, you know, use Quad as an instrument of being able to apply pressure uh, to, to China on many counts, not just use Quad, but there are many other things which are there. On the RCP, the right point which was brought out which is to say that two of the members are also RCP members. You know, therefore, their trade interests can only be perhaps protected by engaging with China. But that is a real fact. But there's not enough analysis within India to say why the RCP signing with India was bad, the timing was bad. And it's in our interest today, according to analysis. I'm not an economist, but I read the economist analysis, which clearly tells us that if we had signed RCP, then, you know, it would have, it would have been... Uh, further trade deficits and China would have used all the third countries to export everything by manufacturing it there 
and getting the concessions of RCEP. Therefore, we have to continue to keep working. You know, uh, the, the next 10 years are very, very uh, challenging for us. And we need to use everything to help us as far as our own uh, trajectory is concerned. Thank you. Over to Admiral now. Yes. Now, before that, uh, uh, I just want to add a point to what you said about uh, the Philippines. You see, what happened was that uh, when the Philippines went to the court, uh, Duterte was a candidate. And as a candidate, he had said that uh, he had given it on, uh, on a video, which was uh, probably given to a Chinese uh, channel. He had said that, look, uh, if I get elected, I will make sure that uh, the, the Philippines doesn't uh, uh, sort of we will withdraw the case. Now, why did he do that? Because his election was funded by China. And the point here to remember is that China has done it in one or two other countries, including Sri Lanka. And there have been reports that it has done it in Australia, and it may have done it in Nepal. So we have to bear that in mind. Over to you, Admiral. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, my sincere apologies uh, for going uh, off the screen towards the end, uh, the end of my presentation. That was the la last slide. And unfortunately, it was a BSNL Wi-Fi network which had gone off. But uh, thankfully, we came back after some time. <clears throat> Coming to these questions, uh, we, first of all, regarding the PCA uh, verdict, uh, First of all, the um, PCA verdict was, uh, or Philippines going to the International Court, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, was a culmination of uh, years of desperation. Uh, actually, in, in um, uh, 2011 and 12, uh, the uh, president, President Hu Jintao, during his time, uh, the taking over of Scarborough Shoal had come up Come up as a proposal to him, but Hu Jintao, being a being a good statesman and uh, going uh, having and since he was a he was a, a milder personality than Xi Jinping, was very um, very um, reluctant about um, permitting the uh, permitting China to take over the Scarborough Shore. But the problem was within the Communist Party, Hu Jintao, especially by his successor Xi Jinping, was seen as a weak leader. And uh, in 2012, that was the end, last year of his presidency, uh, he did not want to leave the legacy of being seen as a weak leader by his uh, successors. So very reluctantly, he agreed to Scarborough Shoal being seized by uh, seized by uh, China. And that is where that is uh, that was a trigger, like I had mentioned, for Philippines to go to the international court. And Xi Jinping, on taking over as the president. Within the first month of his taking over as uh, president, he had visited the um, Chinese Coast Guard units and the uh, People's Armed for Force Maritime Militia, who had been instrumental in harassing the Filipinos in submitting to the Chinese or in, in the Chinese takeover of Scarborough Shoal. And uh, he, uh, the president, uh, Xi Jinping, in the first month of taking over, applauded the Philippines Coast Guard, the PLA Navy, Philippines Coast Guard, and the PA uh, People's Armed Force Mar Maritime Militia. So uh, this was, as is very clear, it was in their agenda for for many years. So uh, and and uh, like um, Commodore Wasson said, they did not participate in the various uh, proceedings of the. Uh, uh, PCA verdict, and they uh, outrightly ignored the even after the verdict had been announced, they outrightly rejected the uh, verdict, saying that it is uh, of no consequence to us. So, therefore, Chinese bullying uh, tactics, high headedness, is something that comes to the fore in this. Uh, coming to the next question of uh, Quad, uh, how can Quad um, uh, come in the way of or can uh, dilute the expansionism of China? Uh, I would only like to say that um, all said and done, uh, as far as military power is concerned and the usage of military power is concerned, there is a world of a difference between, uh, as far as I, uh, my, my understanding goes, between between U.S. and, and China. China may have the numbers, but actually the U.S. has got so many years of uh, experience, especially their carrier battle groups, their uh, air forces, the, the, the technology they use. 
uh, is way ahead of what china has so um, india the the quad exercising together and carrying out um, very complex exercises the, the the scope and complexity of the exercise is massive and the uh, especially an exercise like malabar extends to almost um, 10 11 days i have myself participated in four five of them and they are very very intricate exercises so uh, this malabar exercise has got two components one is the military component which is the naval part of the exercise the other is the diplomatic comp uh, component where it, it is this these exercises are held to say, uh, to send a very clear message and the message as of now is very clear that four important maritime powers that is um, uh, india uh, that, that is us india uh, japan and australia are together in sending a message to china against their expansionism so uh, quad stands for quadrilateral security dialogue and this is the malabar exercise the maritime component of the of that probably in due course we will also have other other um, services uh, uh, participating in a bilateral manner to send a, a very clear message to china as far as their expansionism is concerned uh, as far as rcep is concerned uh, regional comprehensive economic plan um, i agree with whatever uh, commodore wasan has said thank you thank you admiral uh, uh, i have a question to both of you uh, sometime back uh, there were reports that when ongc videsh was uh, active uh, near vietnam uh, some chinese vessels came boats came nearby and said please go away please go away what happened shall i sir admiral please uh, admiral admiral first admiral first uh, uh, we have uh, the ongc videsh uh, has been allotted two blocks block 1 to 7 and block 1 to 8 uh, the uh, uh, the government of uh, vietnam is very keen that india remains invested the ongc videsh remains invested though 1 to 7 uh, is not there is no production happening is in 1 to 7 1 to 8 uh, the production is not uh, to the economic standards but due to the uh, the treaty of friendship that we have with vietnam vietnam is very keen that we stay invested there and uh, china has been very wary of it china has uh, uh, has made a number of overtures as far as we are concerned uh, i don't know in 2011 you may be aware i was uh, i was commanding the eastern fleet that time and one of our ships uh, ins arawat was 45 nautical miles um, away from the vietnamese coast and that is the time the some chinese aircraft came and he uh, the aircraft told other indian naval ship to stay out uh, of the chinese waters we were close to vietnam waters but they made uh, the aircraft had said remain outside chinese waters so there was no confrontation or anything like that but uh, there is a lot of symbolism in that and in my slides i had mentioned that um, they expect china expects all foreign naval vessels to take permission before passing through um, south china sea which is completely in violation of international rules of innocent passage as far as international as far as unclos is concerned uh, uh, ships can even transit through the territorial waters of a coastal state as far as the transit is uh, uh, innocent or the passage is, uh, is innocent so uh, the long and short of all this is that china is uh, very wary of uh, india's friendship or india's assistance to vietnam and they um, always do some sort of um, uh, mischief some sort of mischief whenever either our ships are there or either uh, whenever the uh, uh, when the production was going on when 127 and 128 both were heavily invested in uh properly when when the cvdesh was active in there uh was a commodore wasan sir yeah uh, thank you admiral you know i totally endorse what you have said i just only want to cover uh, two other aspects of this uh not on the ground as to what is happening uh whether it's oil videsh nigam which wanted to carry out exploration or whether it is any vessel which came on behalf of malaysia no their response has been the same you know petromax Uh, I forget the name, but they were carrying out oil exploration in the EZ, which belongs to Malaysia, and they applied the same uh, rule, or to say no, 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 you withdraw them. So uh, the company came under pressure and they withdrew it, but they said we already finished our exploration. The point is, you know, when it comes to their claim 
of the exclusive economic zone they are so sensitive and and they have categorically said the official statement said that we should not do anything in disputed areas now i just pose this counter question in many of the forums including china and say that what are you guys doing in china pok economic corridor is it not we are not saying it's a disputed area but in the worst standards you can consider it a disputed area why are you investing there there are no answers so it's a typical application of double standards as far as china is concerned they will continue to use their economic power and military power to try and get them what they want so i don't i don't think the whether the american ships or the indian warships or whatever who are transiting the south china sea or in these exclusive economic zones which are disputed are really worried about china's challenges so we ignore them and carry on as admiral rightly brought out there are international conventions and according to unclos you can even pass through the territorial waters as long as it's an innocent passage so all the passages that have taken place are related to innocent passage and as far as oil videsh nigam is concerned if chinese can come and invest anything uh, in uh, uh, pakistan i don't see why we cannot invest in vietnam or malaysia or indonesia or wherever they have a dispute i would go to the extent of saying wherever they have a dispute we should go and pitch your flag thank you <laughs> correct well, thank you um i do not have uh, any other question but i have an uh, observation from uh, vice admiral pj jacob well i had uh, the privilege of being with him in iran before and after the revolution he has given this observation from bangalore very exhaustive and thought provoking presentations with interesting suggestions for the way ahead now before closing uh, i shall just uh, make a few points not new points yeah, but just to re emphasize some of the points already made one is that uh, whatever space china has occupied it's a fait accompli there is hardly any prospect of uh, you know throwing china out of that space much will depend on what the united states does under biden all that we can say is that there is an across the board uh, consensus in the united states that china is the rival and just and that china's rise has to be stopped and reversed and biden will be more mature than uh, trump uh, has been he will be less impulsive so we will have to wait for that as regards quad also well every every member of the quad is important but primarily it will depend on the united states uh, um now also both japan and australia are vulnerable to commercial economic pressures from uh, china the whole thing has to be seen in perspective uh, and uh, uh it is possible that china has miscalculated it is also possible that china might i repeat might recognize it has miscalculated because if you notice uh, you know they have made uh, some gestures towards japan and south korea very recently so it's an unfolding story we have had a very vigorous interactive multi dimensional uh, discussion let us give a big hand to the distinct to the two distinguished panelists and Let's Thank also you, give a big hand, big Thank hand to the, to the audience, and we also thank the audience as well as Tete, the head of the program division of the India International Center. Thank you. Also, Thank you very much, also to Wasim, you know the support team of the IIC. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you, Jai Hind, sir. Jai.